Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry that offers streaming and downloadable Bible studies in video and MP3 format, all free of charge. The United Body of Christ app is also available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone App Store. Please note, here at United Body of Christ Church, we are not affiliated with any other ministries that may carry the same name. For our viewers who don't have Bibles, you can follow us along by visiting our website at www.ubcchurch.org and selecting the online Bible tab. From there, select the book of the Bible that we're studying from in the drop-down menu, then type in the chapter and click the Find Scripture button. If you are in need of prayer, select the Prayer Request tab on our website and fill out your confidential information and please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lastly, we ask that you visit our prayer list page and pray for your brothers and sisters whose names are on that prayer list. And now, let us join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible lesson. God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. Welcome to another Bible study. My name is LaDora. I'm the wife of Pastor Clarence Harden. And don't worry, Pastor Clarence Harden is doing the Bible study today, but he asked me to open us up with prayer. And so if you all would, if you would bow your heads and focus your hearts on your minds on the Most High God. Bless you, Father in heaven. Father, we bless your holy name. God, we bless you and we assemble before you today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace and the Prince of Life, your only begotten Son. Father, we glorify you. We bless you. You are worthy of all the praise. You are worthy of all the honor and the glory. You're worthy of the accolades. You're worthy to be respected and feared and worshipped. And we adore you and bless you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for blessing us to be alive and well and a part of this day. Thank you for blessing us to come together to learn and study your word. Father, I ask you if you would bless the teacher of your word. And I also ask if you would bless everybody listening to understand your word, to know how to apply it to their lives and to get the joy that comes from your word. For your word is spirit, as your son said, and it is life. And God, I ask you if you would bless each and every person to, to be strengthened. I ask if you would bless them in the area of faith. If it's anything anybody is going through, Heavenly Father, I ask if you would bless them to confide in you and to trust in you and to not just trust in you, but to patiently wait on you and your mighty hand to move in their lives. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for long suffering with each and every one of us. And God, we thank you. We thank you for grafting us in. We thank you for blessing us to be a part of your kingdom and for blessing us to be your children and a, and a part of the body of Christ. In all things, your majesty, we pray that your will be done and that you be glorified. Even in our lesson today, Father, be glorified. God, we thank you. We ask all these things and we bless you in the name of your beloved son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, if you give us a few minutes, you'll see a switch over. We're going to have Pastor come in. He's in the room. You just can't see him. <laughs> We're going to have him come over, and we'll get started with today's Bible study lesson. Amen. God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers. I'm excited about this lesson today. I bless the Lord our God for who he is, how he is, and what he does within our lives, the provisions that he makes uh, the prayers that he hears and answers, the companionship, uh, the fellowship that he bestows upon us, how we draw near to him, and it causes him to draw near unto us. Amen. He's a respectable God, and he will only approach you as much as you want to be approached. Amen. A uh, great lesson for today. I'm excited about it. Uh, bless the Lord my God for the help that he has given me within my wife. Um, I won't keep you any longer because we have a lot to cover. So uh, giving honor to God who is the chef of the meal that you and I are about to break and to receive. 
giving honor unto his son, the Lord Jesus, who is Christ. He is that bread of life, this bread that you and I are about to break and receive, of course. Uh, he is also the word of God, amen. Uh, and also giving honor unto his Holy Spirit, who has moved my wife and myself, who has also invited you to come and to commune, uh, uh, to sup. Uh, in fellowship uh, within these Bible studies with the Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, as well as my wife and myself. Uh, so again, we give honor to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Without any further ado, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, let's eat. Again, this is First uh, Corinthians. We're going going in at First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Don't believe that we'll have any time. I think we'll be full off of uh, chapter 15 so we'll get to it again first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 moreover brethren uh, I declare unto you by the, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received and wherein ye stand by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preach unto you unless uh, ye have believed in vain. And I love that. What, what a great start for us. Um, we hear from time to time, and I'm one of these ones, and I'm under the opinion that uh, once saved, not always saved. And Paul kind of, the way I believe, Paul kind of edifies my belief and my confidence in my belief. Uh, again, he says here in verse 2, By which ye also are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. And we want to give some examples of believing in vain, but let's deal with the main thing here first. Paul says, You're, you are saved if you continue in this particular way. If if you keep in memory, which means if you continue to observe those things which you are taught and you don't deviate from them. Uh, so it's saying that it's possible in my and in, in, in what I perceive here is he's saying that it's possible to lose your salvation, which I consider to be the equivalent of having your name uh, uh, blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. So hold your place here and go with me to Revelation uh, chapter 3. 3 verses 3 through 5. Revelation chapter 3 verses 3 through 5. And I would not have you ignorant, my brothers and sisters. I don't want you going and, and living life uh, believing that uh, once saved, always saved, and you can go and do those things that you want to do that you did before you were saved and, and, and still think you will be rewarded with salvation. Uh, I would have you believe the contra I would have you believe a contrary to that is that it's able for you to forfeit uh, uh, that which God has given to you. Not that he takes it, but that you forfeit it. Amen. So look at this. This is Revelation chapter 3 beginning at verse uh, 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know at what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which has not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So again, if it was impossible to, to lose your salvation, why would the Lord say that he would, he would blot your name out? He will erase your name out of his Lamb's book of life. Amen. Now, uh, dealing with the other thing that Paul says here in verse 2, he says, by which you also are saved if you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, meaning that you don't deviate uh, from, from the word of God, from his guidance, from upholding his truths and his righteousness, the righteousness that, uh, that's in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you stand firm on those things. Because 
That's the substance of our relationship with God. These very things, these truths that we have received from the word of God, letting us know about his ordinances, those things that he doesn't like, how we should be separated. It's the way that we are towards our Lord Jesus Christ who's redeemed us. We don't just want to make him our Lord. Uh, we don't just want to make him our Savior, rather, uh, meaning the one that has saved us from our sins, but we also want to make him our Lord, meaning that we obey him. And that's that's part of being, that's part of remaining saved, okay? But then he says this other part here that we need to pay some attention to. Unless you have believed in vain. And there are times that people can hear the word of God and the man of God is, is really being a messenger that God has called him to be and he's hitting you with the truth left and right, taking jibes at your, at your flesh to get your, to, to drop your flesh so that your spirit can rise and that you can say amen. And there is people that hear that message and they receive it and they're glad to have gotten it. And, and, and they'll, they'll go up to the altar and they'll confess that Jesus is Lord. And then as soon as they move out of the place of worship, they go back to their own places and their own lives doing the same old things before they confess Jesus is Lord. And what has happened is they didn't, it didn't take root. And this is probably an example of what Paul is saying about unless you believed in vain. You know, it was this, it, it, it was all for show. It there, there wasn't nothing there. And for that, to give an example of that, what I deem to be an example, go with me to chapter 13 of, of the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13. And we want to take a look at verses 1 through 9, and then verses 18 through 23. Verses 1 through 9 of Matthew chapter 13. Uh, and then verses 18 through 23. And here's what the Lord, here's what the uh, word of the Lord has to say. Uh, what did I say? One through nine. So the same day went Jesus out of the house and he sat by the seaside. And a great multitude were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship. He sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold. A sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith uh, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. There was no root. You know, they heard, that, well, well, we'll get to that. Let me get through the parables, get out of the way of the scripture and go through the parable here. And when the sun was come up, or when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Uh, some, but others fell into good ground and brought up some, brought forth fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who, who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Now we'll drop down to verse eighteen. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catches away that which was sown in their heart. That is, he which receives seed by the wayside. So in the parable, when he says, some fell among the wayside, he said, some fell among the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And so he begins to, um, to break down what he meant by that. And he was saying that, uh, when it, when when you hear the word of God, and it sounds good, but you really don't deposit it into your spirit, right? You hear it; it sounds good. You're moved by it, but it hasn't. You haven't. Uh, uh, you haven't allowed yourself to really receive it to where you're subject to be changed by it. Okay, it's like having it in your pocket, but you never deposit it into the bank. And then all of a sudden, here comes the thief, and he comes to, to pickpocket you. And right when you need it the most, you dig into your pocket so you can, you can draw from it. 
Well, it's gone. There's nothing to draw there because when you've had it, you didn't do, you wasn't real expeditious about doing what was right with it. Meaning, you didn't deposit it into your spirit. You didn't meditate it. You didn't get to the point that you said, I'm going to adhere to this regardless of what goes on in my life. I'm going to stand on this word because this is who I am and this is what I'll do. He goes on to say, but he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and immediately, that word in not, and non is immediately, and immediately with joy they received it, and, and he hath not root in himself, but endured for a short while, for when tribulation or persecution arises of the word, uh, by, by and by he is offended. This is another person, and these are examples of what I consider uh, uh, receiving it in vain, right? It's 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 a it's it's all to me. It's like cosmetics, right? You you may be you know makeups and stuff. You may be dressing a face, but how is your inner man? How is your spirit man? You can paint the face, but how is your inner man? And that's how receiving things in vain when it comes to the word of God. It's, it's like makeup for the outer man if you don't receive it. But when it's time to actually adhere to the principles and the precepts of it, it washes off your face because it was never applied to the inner man who needed it the most, right? So immediately you receive this, immediately you hear it and you rejoice over what you heard and you say that you're going to apply it to your life. Right, so that you can reap the harvest and the fruits from it. And for the word's sake, something has to cultivate the word that you just received. Now, this is where people this is this is some powerful stuff as as I'm about to say here. When people come out of the world and come into uh the kingdom of God, it's the transition is it's a peaceful transition, but there comes a boot camp. OK, and when you go into the boot camp of the kingdom, in order to get you to start depending on God and, 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 and walking with him and, and staying close with him and adhering to his precepts, there has to be some trial and tribulation. OK, so there's going to be uh, uh, there's going to be a little heartache and a little heartbreak because you have to be broke from the world and and start to, and, and 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 transform into a person that lives by the word of God. And that when people hear that life is easier in the kingdom and so well when you transition it's more peaceful coming into the kingdom than than having experienced that of the world. But don't for one minute believe that you're not going to have trial and tribulation being a soldier, a son or daughter of the most high God. And you're supposed to have that. Look at what the verse says here. It says, yet have, in verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a short while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the, because of the word. It has to, the word puts you into position. Once you become a new convert, the word has to break the world off of you. And in order to do that, it has to subject you to some trial and tribulation. People think when they come into the kingdom, life is easy and it's peaceful and, you know, I can live out the rest. No, you're going to experience some, some heartache and some heartbreak because you're coming out of the world and you have to have the world out of you. And so it takes the, the word of God to cleanse you. And in order to cleanse you, it has to wipe the filth of the world out off of you. Some of those are tattoos that have been stained on you. It's not dirt. It's tattoos of the world on you. And in order to get that stuff off, it's going to hurt. But for the word's sake, you have to be subject to that. And that's when we start to lose many people out of the boot camp of the kingdom. Because once they experience the trial and tribulation in the kingdom of having to be broke from the world, a lot of folk can't handle it. They say, I didn't sign up for this. And then they go back to where they where they came from. And this is when you sit and receive it in vain. What you hear, it sounds good and you say, okay. And you make your commitment. And, and then once the tough, once the... What's the, what they what what is that slogan? What's the tough 
once things get tough, the tough get going. In this case, when, when things get hard, instead of staying there for the fight, you break, you break camp and go back. So a lot of people, a lot of new people, when they hear things in vain, they don't make it through boot camp. The boot camp of the kingdom, which is I consider the trial and tribulation for the word's sake. They don't make it through this boot camp course and they end up going back. And that's an example of what Paul is saying, unless you received it in vain. It can't do nothing for you if you don't allow it to and if you don't stay with it, right? People won't. We live in a, you often hear the term, we live in a microwave generation because people want results immediately. And what you fail to realize in that when you come into the kingdom is you didn't get the way that you are overnight. Those bad habits that you picked up, uh, um, the ways, uh, the, the, the things that you do that you've been doing over the course of decades, you didn't get that way overnight. You've committed to changing overnight, but you didn't get that way overnight. So therefore, there is a course correction that has to take place with you, and it happens, the process starts now, but the, but the end results is over the course of time. And people want it if they don't see results now or if it's too hard, they get going because it got too tough. But that's what Paul is saying unless you, unless you believed in vain. Hmm? It was all for show, right? And just finishing up here in Matthew uh, verse 22, he, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and, and, and then the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, they choke the word and he become unfruitful. But he that received the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. So it's talking about how it's going to bring forth the harvest. If you stay with the word, if you stay with God, if you obey the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going, you're going to bring forth fruit. You're going to see the results of your commitment, and you're going to see it. And that's a person that has not received it in vain. Amen? That's a person that has not believed in vain. So that's pretty deep. We wanted to cover those things here. Number one, as Paul was saying, uh, by, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory, if you stay this course, uh, uh, you'll, you'll remain saved. If you don't have uh, uh, this course correction going back to the world, you'll remain saved. Number two, uh, if, you, if you haven't believed in vain, meaning that regardless of what's going on, your, your faith is not for show. You didn't get happy because everybody was looking and you tried to put on a show. You didn't confess Jesus as Lord because it was expedient, you know. Uh, you did it because you believed you're going to stay with him. You're not going to rush this relationship. You don't meet somebody today and then tomorrow you propose to marry them. You know, they don't work like that. You, you, you stay the course, you know, you, you, not unless you are looking for some, <laughs> some immigration status, some green card or something. But if you believe that, that this is who you're supposed to be with and she's, whom you believe you're supposed to be with. If y'all believe this together, you, you're committed to the relationship, then you're going to spend this time, regardless of how hard it, it gets, you're going to spend this time hanging in there one with another to get to know one another. And you're supposed to go through some hard times with your mate so that you can muster the strength to get through them together so that you don't grow apart, but that you grow together. There has to be something to, to some, have some trial and tribulation so you know what your strengths and weaknesses are that you may grow together. Well, that's this relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are supposed to go through some, some events, some trials and tribulations. So we got so much more to cover. So let me get away from that and handle the rest of some things here because we have a lot that we have to deal with here. Uh, so verse 3 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I, which I also received. So I, I was, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve. And that, that name there, Cephas, translates in other translations, it's saying that Cephas is actually Peter. So he was seen of Peter and then the disciples. Okay, so it's saying the twelve disciples, Peter, you got twelve disciples including Peter. But if this is right, that's that it's actually saying Cephas is Peter. It's also saying that he was seen of the other of of the rest of the disciples as well. Amen. So, according to some of the translations, it's saying that 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 it, he was seen of Peter. It's saying that that uh, Cephas is Peter. Amen. Um, now, what's going on here? Uh, that Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth. And he's going to let us know here the reason why he's talking about resurrection is because somebody is spreading rumors within the church of Corinth, which in the church of Corinth, that there is no resurrection. Okay? So somebody who's ever in there, there is a problem that they're telling people that there is no resurrection. So as, Pete, as Paul is talking with them, he lets them know, he says that, uh, I come. He's he's letting them know the way that I am, the way that I believe, and the way that I received. I'm giving you the product that has changed my life. Uh, what I heard, what I received, and what I've applied to my life totally changed me. And that's how I know it's true because of what the morsel of it that I've received. How significant it changed my life. And, and, and because of this truth, I've given you the product that I was using myself so that it can have the same effects on you. However, someone here is trying to mitigate the effects that this product of faith is supposed to have in your life. They're trying to make the word of God of none effect because they're trying to douse your faith with doubt. Okay? Just like you could put water on, on a flame, they're trying to douse your faith with doubt. And so Peter, I'm sorry, not Peter, Paul is trying to address this as it's come up. And he says, what I've taken in verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I, which I also received, and how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So it's talking about Jesus' resurrection. And he's going to spend some time talking about how important it is for Jesus to have written, to have, to have risen, rather, from the dead. He goes on to say in verse 6, After that he was seen um, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So he's saying that there are witnesses, there's a, there are faithful witnesses that have seen the Lord Jesus after his resurrection. See, he's not trying to prove that Jesus died. It's, it's well known. It was the talk of everything. How Jesus was, was crucified on the cross, how he laid down his life and he died. He's not trying to prove his death. What he's trying to do is prove his resurrection through the, uh, through the testimony of witnesses. And, and so he's trying to put to shame the people that said that Jesus have not risen from the dead. He's trying to put them to shame because it's big implications. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then there is no eternal life for us. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then there is no salvation for us. So he's trying to make sure that their faith is not uh, uh, is not diluted with doubt to make them of none of to make their salvation of none effect because that's why somebody would tell you that that there is no resurrection of the dead because they're they're trying to make you think that there is no afterlife and there is no power over death and that everything that's being taught and preached to you is is a lie and there's no truth to it that's why people would tell you that right so again uh, the Apostle Paul is trying to put those matters to rest by illustrating and repeating the testimony and he says 
He was seen of over 500 people. Some of those people are still alive today and they can tell you what I just told you. Some of them have already been laid to rest. He was seen of Peter. Peter could come here and tell you today that Christ Jesus rose from the dead, right? Uh, verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Now, that's a powerful statement. Why? Because we know that it was, and we believe that this James is the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that his brothers didn't believe in him at first. As a matter of fact, let's go to it. Go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. The Gospel of John, chapter 7, and we'll start at verse 3. So this is, there is a reason why he was, that, why he would say that he was seen of James and then the rest of the apostles. There is a reason. Because it was, the, the brothers didn't believe, even though they lived with him, they didn't believe in him at first. Uh, what did I say? The Gospel of John, chapter 7. And uh, verses 3 through 7. And here's what the word of the Lord says. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea. Ask, actually, let me give you some context. Let's start at verse 1. Uh, chapter 7 of the Gospel of John, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in, walked in Galilee, for he would not go into Jewry because of the Jews sought to kill him. Okay, so there were certain areas of Judea that he didn't want to go into because he knew that, the, that there was a bounty on him, if you will. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacle was at hand. His brethren said, therefore, unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see thy works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. So they're antagonizing him. They're being facetious. His own brothers, they're being facetious to him. Yeah, we've seen some of the miracles that you, some of the card tricks that you were able to do. If you believe that you are who you say you are, we believe some of the magic that you was able to do. Well, that's fine. I, I can go find anybody can do that. I read in a book where I read in the scrolls where Pharaoh's men were able to pull off some of the things that Moses did. You know, so these are, and I'm not saying that they said this, but this is the attitude that they've had. Right. And so they're trying to antagonize him. They're trying to provoke him and they're, they're, they're belittling him. They're belittling him. If you're doing these things, no one can, that, that, that has this call and that does the things that they're able to do are trying to keep themselves in secret. You're trying to, you know, let everyone see you so that things can be fulfilled. If what you say is true. Right. Uh, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret and he, him, he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. So this is why, this is why, Pete, uh, why, why Paul, the apostle Paul, would say he was seen of James, his brother. He would single out James because it was a life-changing event. James may have rolled with the ministry for a little bit, but to to know that he was probably one of the one of the brothers that antagonized him, that didn't really believe in him. As scripture says, his brothers didn't believe in him. Um, then Jesus said unto him in verse 6, My time is not yet come, but your time is already ready. Meaning that because I'm here, just like the rest of the Jews got a chance to believe and accept if, if, I'm, if I'm who I say I am, meaning the only begotten Son of God, it's on you as well. It's incumbent upon you as well uh, uh, to to accept the gift of salvation by believing that I'm I am who I say that I am. He said your time is now because it's incumbent upon you to believe. No different than the rest of the Jews is incumbent upon them to believe. Your time is now. He was like it's not yet for me to 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 go and walk through some of these areas and allow myself to be caught because there's still too much work to be done. However, <laughs> your time is now, right? So this is why, uh, again, that that I would assume that uh, the Apostle Paul would say that he was also seen of James because he's making a correlation that this is one of the brothers that didn't believe, right? Then he goes on to say in verse 8, and last of all, he was seen of me also. 
Remember, he's not making the case that he was actually killed or that he actually laid down his life, that he actually died. He's making the case that he was resurrected from the dead. And out of all the people he went through, he was seen of Peter. He was seen of 500 people after that. Some died, but there are some that are still living today that can, that can cooperate what I just told you. He was also seen of his brother that didn't believe, and now his brother is a faithful witness to testify that he saw Jesus after he died. And then last of all, he was seen of me. I'm a living witness to tell you that I seen the living Jesus Christ after he laid down his life, right? And so he's trying again to put to shame to some of those things that's being said, mainly that, G, that there is no resurrection from the dead. He says, for I am least of the apostles that am not, he says that I'm not worthy, that meet to be called an apostle. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I've persecuted the church of, the church of God. I'm the one, I, I'm the last one that will come and take up for the honor of, of the Lord Jesus Christ because I was on a mission and I was zealous about my mission. I was on a mission to persecute the church of God because I felt like there was no room for that kind of belief in our society. Until I had my encounter with them on a road to Damascus and it changed my life. So I can come and tell you today that he is alive forevermore. And this is this is the message that the Apostle Paul is teaching and telling, uh, testifying to the church of Corinth. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, what I am now, I am because of the grace of God. Not what I was then, but what I am now, I am what I am because of the grace of God working on me and working through me. He goes on to say, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. It, it, it wasn't anything that he wasted on me that I just went back to persecuting. Because of his grace, his favor, the favor that I did not deserve, he spared me. He could have killed me because of what I did to his people, but I did it in ignorance. And then he bestowed his grace upon me to work with me in favor that I did not deserve. And once he opened the eyes of my spirit and I realized my wrong, I repented and now I work just as hard as I work to persecute the church. I work just as hard to save people that want to be a part of the church. Look at what he says here. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It wasn't wasted. But I labored more abundantly than they all. He's talking about in comparison to the apostles. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So as hard as I worked to persecute the church, I worked just as hard to go forth, to go throughout and to, uh, to uh, convert people to be a part of the church. Some might say that I worked harder than the, than the apostles did or than, than the other disciples did. Some may say I worked harder than they did. You know, but it's because of what I did. As zealous as I was on one side of it, I'm just as zealous on the other side. So again, he's he's uh, he's letting them know that I'm the last one to come forth and 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 to take up for the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ if I didn't believe and if I didn't see him for myself. Right. In verse eleven, therefore, whether it were whether it were I or they. So we preached, and so you believe. So now he's going back to how they got a chance to be saved, whether it was by my preaching or by the apostles' teaching. You believed, you heard, you believed, and you received, and so you are saved. Verse 12, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So again, this is now what the gist of the whole matter is. Again, because you got people saying that he has not risen from the dead, right? He goes on to say, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then there is, then is our preaching in vain. 
and your faith is also in vain. So my preaching is futile because it, it's I'm just I'm I'm a con artist. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then what's the point of our preaching? You might as well call me a con artist. You might as well say our preach our preaching is futile. That I'm just trying to I'm just trying to have control over your life or something. No, I'm preaching to you the truth that Jesus did rise from the dead. And not only am I preaching the truth to you, but I'm also giving you testimony to say not only I've seen him after his death, but there were others that have seen him after his death. And with all this, and the fact that you believed, how could you even question if he rose from the dead? Then what's the point of our preaching? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So he says, not only are we con, but we, we claim we came from God. Now we're saying that God didn't have no power. If you believe that God didn't raise Christ from the dead, then you're saying that God had no power and we're not his representatives. I mean, this, this, this is an, a resounding effect if you allow the doubt to to to. The doubt will bring forth carnage of your faith. That's just the bottom line. And so he's trying to kill it. He's trying to squash the doubt. He says, if, he says, for if the dead, in verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And we have no salvation. Because Christ rises, therefore giving him power over his last enemy, which is death. Meaning that now Christ has power over death. Meaning that we can now have eternal life because we have power over death. Because our Lord, he whom we uh, answer to, observe, and obey, he is our Lord and our Savior because of what he's done for us. Because he conquered death, we shall too when the time comes. But if he didn't rise from the dead then he did not conquer death. Meaning that once we die, that's our final state. There is no life after death. It has an astounding effect if you would allow doubt to rest in the place of your faith. Um, verse, 18, verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins then there is no atonement for your sins. Then there is no forgiveness for your sins if there is no atonement for them. And there is no power over sin. If, if Christ have... See, he came and he conquered death. He also conquered sin because there was no sin in him. And he took our sins and they were nailed to the cross with them. But if he didn't die and, and if he wasn't resurrected to have power over sin as well, then you are still in your sins. And, and if you are still in your sins, then there is no atonement for your sins, which means there is no forgiveness, which means there is condemnation, which means there is no salvation. So it has a domino effect. That's why we have to believe the right way that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life should have eternal life but you're also saying that god if you don't believe that he was raised from the dead then you're then you're saying that god didn't raise him and you're also saying possibly that god didn't send his own son because there was nothing accomplished hmm? it has a, a domino effect if you allow it to carnage if you allow doubt to carnage your faith okay verse 18 then they also which are fallen asleep in christ are perish if in this life we only have hope in Christ, we are all men of miserable, or we are all men to be pitied, because there is no life after death if what we take to be true, that, that Christ, if we, if we take the lie and turn it into a truth that Christ raised not from the dead, then we are people which are in despair, because there is no life after this. There is no hope, right? There is no hope. There is always a hope for us. Even when you have 
a bad day, even when we have a day where things don't go our way. I don't know about you, but with me, when if I have a day that there is a, a, a collage of various things that happens and, and, and these things that have happened has tried me and, pro and to some extent have gotten the best of me, the day didn't go as I had hoped it would have gone. Um, I'm always looking forward to another day. It's my hope. I look forward to another day. And, and, and I always say this. I say to myself, um, there, there, is, uh, there, is a, there is a hope. There is a bond, a bomb in another day. There is a healing uh, in the day. That's how I look at things. I say that to myself. There is a healing. There is a bomb. Um, there is a hope in another day. And I'm, I, the, the, they have gotten the best of me today. But I look forward to the changing of the new day because it's like the changing of the guard. And it's another opportunity to get right what I didn't get right the day before. Right? It's a, day, it's a chance for me to get the best of the day instead of the day getting the best of me. Amen. And so, that's my hope for another day. But as saints and as believers, we, we have a hope for a better future with that of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes for us. Our faith is predicated on that hope. It will bring you to tears because you know he loves you. And he's coming for you, right? He's going to come for you, right? That's your hope. But to say that he has not risen from the dead is to say that he's not coming for you. And the state of affairs as of what they are now, there is no hope that things will ever change. There is no hope that you will have to, that you'll be able to spend the rest of your life with God because there was no one there to pay the price. I, there is no one there to have paid the price to have redeemed you. So this is what Paul said, we are miserable. We are meant to be pitied more than anybody because our hope is in vain. Our hope is null and void. So that's what he's saying here. Aye, powerful Bible study, folks. I, I, I'm a receiver when, it, when, it, when, the, uh, when the ox uh, treadeth out the, the field, when the, you hitch a, a plow to an ox and it begins to go forth to plow the fields, it eats the very thing that, that it plows so that it would have the strength to continue to plow. Well, guess what? I'm plowing this field, and I'm getting an opportunity to eat just like you, and it's good. Amen? So it's pretty powerful here. But going on here, verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead, I God, and become the first fruits of them that slept, those that have died, he has become the first fruits, meaning that he is the first representative of them who have conquered dead, who have conquered death. Amen? For since by man came death, by man came also resurrection from the dead. And it's saying Adam brought death, but Jesus brought forth life, eternal life. Amen? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This is the wisdom of God. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are at Christ, they that are Christ at his coming. Now, hold your place and go with me to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. Verses 15 through 17. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. So it's talking about the order of things. Um, how we're going to be risen from the dead. In what order things shall happen. Now, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. Here's verse 15. This is what the word of the Lord says. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, or we shall not precede them. So those that have believed in Jesus and, and was laid to rest, 
that they died for some causes. When Christ comes for, for us, they shall be the first ones to rise and to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord himself, in verse 16, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So remember it says, um, but every man in his own order. It's talking about in which order, so it's saying the dead shall rise first. Verse 17, then we, then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we never be, and I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, not never. That is, you know, the flesh gets in the way of things from time to time. But the Lord allows me to correct it. <laughs> and the Lord allows me to correct it. Because that one word can change the whole meaning. Uh, so then rereading this. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So every man in his own order. So Christ has risen first. That's done. Okay? Now, those which are dead in Christ, which means they believe, they believed and have received Jesus being the only begotten Son of God and that he was risen, uh, he was laid to rest, he gave up his life and was resurrected from the dead. And so they believe and have received that truth. And so they shall be uh, brought from the dead and brought to the sky. And then those of us that are alive on the earth when he comes, after the dead goes, then we shall go. So we're not, that word prevent is, we're not going to precede those that go first, uh, and which are those that, that are asleep in Christ. And then after, we shall go. He said, wherefore comfort one another uh, with these words. So that's what, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here when he says every man in his own order. Verse 24, uh, then cometh the end when we shall have the, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to us, to God, even the father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and all power for he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. So it's saying that once Christ has put all his enemies to shame, once he has uh, subdued all of his enemies. He's, got a, he's going to reign for a thousand years. And then at the end of his reign, the, the enemy is going to be let out one more time uh, from, his, from his chains. And then Christ is going to take the enemy. He's going to take death and all, of, all that comes with it. All of, all of sin's children, the enemy's children, uh, and, and, and death with it is all going to be cast into the lake of fire. And once the last enemy, meaning death, has been cast into the lake of fire, then Christ Jesus will submit the kingdom uh, to his father. And then Christ becomes subject to the rule of the Lord God, his, his own father. Amen. But until all of his enemies are vanquished, he's, he is going to rule so that when he turns the kingdom over to his father, there is no enemy. They're all taken care of. And then there is peace once and for all. Amen. Powerful, powerful stuff here. It says, uh, all authority and power. For verse 25. For he must reign till he put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Uh, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest or it is evident that he is expected. Or he is accepted, um, which did all, which did put all things uh, uh, under his feet. So he's making, he's saying here that uh, when Christ put all things under his feet and he has all authority, it's saying that God is not the one that has given him the authority is not going to be subject to Jesus. He is accepted from that. He's he is he is he is set aside from being. Uh, you understand, if if I'm giving you all authority, all command, I'm not the one that's still, on, I'm not the one that's under your authority. I'm just giving you the authority to do what you need to get done. And then you're going to give me the authority back. 
but even as you have the authority, I still have charge over you. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying that for he had put all things, but when he said all things are put under him, it is evident or manifest that he is accepted, uh, which did put all things under him. He is not part of that equation. The one that has put all things under your feet or given you the authority of all is not part of your authority. Uh, but when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto, the, unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So that's the Godhead. Uh, G God is the head of Jesus. Jesus is the head of man. And, and man is the head of woman. And as God has given G Jesus authority over all things, he, Jesus still don't, he doesn't have the authority over God. And the time comes that when Jesus has did everything that God had told him to do, and he has finished all things, then all the authority that God ha all the authority that God has placed in the hands of Jesus, Jesus will hand that authority back over to God, and then all will be complete. Amen. So that's what it's saying here. Verse twenty nine. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Now, this is a real interesting verse, and we'll talk about this. Let me let me read it, and then we'll talk about it. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? For if the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? It's an interesting scripture. I've heard, to, to what extent, I don't know how true this is. I've heard that, uh, my wife and I talked a little bit about this too, because she heard the same thing, that in Catholicism, um, you can actually pay money and I could be wrong. So those of you that are Catholic, and I think, but I, I would think that those of you that are Catholic, if you remain to be, or or to still practice Catholicism, that you just this is not part of your walk. This this Bible study has not been part of your daily nourishment. You probably bailed on us a long time ago, and we still love you. It's all good. But I've heard in Catholicism that. The loved ones that are that you believe are in purgatory, that you can actually pay money to have them come out of purgatory. As at least that's the practice of their particular faith. This is something similar, but Paul is not. I don't get the sense that Paul is condoning that. What I do believe is he is he is being somewhat facetious as he says that that. You don't believe that Christ did, then then why y'all still trying to uh, be baptized for those that were not able to be baptized? If you don't believe that Christ risen from the dead, then why do you have people still sitting here trying to baptize, uh, trying to be baptized for people that can't that can't be baptized because they're dead? I don't believe he's condoning that. I, what I do believe is he's being facetious as he's making his point that Christ was risen from the dead. So let's re -re let's reread the scripture. He says, well, uh, let's start with 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that has put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And, and the last enemy is death. We're still talking about death. We're saying that Christ mastered death, or he, he has the mastery over death, meaning he's put death. He subdued it. Death is under his authority. And he and then he was like, if that's not true, then why else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If they if the dead rise not, why are they then baptized for the dead? You know, there's nothing left for them to do. If they if you go and convince them, that's the I you don't have a hard time convincing them. I don't think Paul is is condoning what they're doing. I think he's using it as a point to reference uh, his his testimony that Jesus has risen from the dead, and he's saying those that be that's off in that practice that are doing this thing. Why are they doing it if there is no resurrection from the dead? Why are they doing that then? Why would they be baptized? And why are they if if the people that are laid to rest if they don't have life afterwards? What's the point in people trying to be baptized for their behalf if if they're not going to rise from the dead? You know, 
I mean, why would people still be doing that if they if if there was no hope for those for for life after death? Why would people still be doing that? You know. So I, again, I don't. I'm one of these ones that don't believe Paul was condoning this practice. What I do believe is that he was being facetious as he used it to validate his argument that Jesus did rise from the dead and he conquered death. He has the mastery over death. Amen. So. Uh, he goes on to say in verse 30, and why stand ye in jeopardy, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? If I didn't believe that Christ was risen from the dead and we have life after death, then why do we put our lives on the line hour by hour? Because the same people that sought to kill Jesus for telling them that there was life after death, that there was an eternal life, that there was a, a, an everlasting life, he died for his message. We're putting our lives on the line by continuing his gospel. And if there is no truth in it, then why would we subject ourselves to a death penalty by continuing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? He goes on to say in verse 31, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. He says, I continue to be passionate, uh, uh, giving thanks to God concerning you because you received this. And he said, because you have received the truth, I don't mind putting my life on the line daily because I know that you have received this truth. So it don't, it don't bother me to do this. I just, if we don't believe it, then why would we do it? Because I believe that you have received. And so I don't mind doing it because I believe that you received it. Hmm? If after the manner of men I fought with the beast at Ephesus, what advantage it me? If the dead rise not, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He says after all we gone through at Ephesus, dealing with the brutality of men, what would we, why would we go through that? If there was no resurrection from the death, from the dead, why would we even go through that? Should we take the scripture into consideration and be like the children of Israel that just, let's just eat and, and play, let's just eat and, and drink and, and then just die, to, just, just, just die tomorrow. We have no time for faith. We just going to do what we going to do what we do. And then after that, we'll just lay down our lives and die because there is nothing left. And they're taking that from Isaiah 22 and 13. And let's, let's just go there real quick. I know we're a little pressed for time. I'm trying to get through this. But go with me to Isaiah chapter 23 or chapter 22 verse 13. Chapter 22 verse 13. Just so I, I can give you somewhat of context uh, what, he's, what, what the Apostle Paul is talking about. And we'll actually start a little before this. Um, verse 9 uh, Isaiah chapter 22 verse 9 you have seen also the breaches of the city of David that, that are many you have gathered together the waters of the lower pool you have numbered the houses of Jerusalem the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall you've also made a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool but you have not looked unto the maker thereof Neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. You've done everything you can to, to, to um, fortify yourselves, your lives, to fortify your lifestyle, uh, for you to enjoy the everyday necessities. You've done all those things. And you've done it under what you consider to be your own power, your own will, your own, uh, your own influences. But you haven't factored me into the equation the Lord of hosts you haven't you haven't factored God and you thought that the things that you've been able to accomplish was that of your own doing and in that and in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth and behold joy and gladness slain oxen and killing sheep eating eating flesh and drinking wine, let us eat today 
let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, said the Lord. So, all the things that, and it's talking about Israel, the things that they did in this particular time, they didn't honor the Lord God who allowed them to be able to have access to those things. They didn't make room for them. They didn't glorify the Lord God who looked out for them in their, in, in their time of wars and calamities and in their time of prosperity. They just didn't make room for them. We eat and drink and tomorrow we die. It's just, that was just the way they went about life. Didn't want to honor him. And so Paul is saying, should I take the same approach? Uh, am I left with the same approach? Eat, drink, and then tomorrow we die. Not having any hope for anything better. Not making room for God who has made room for us. Right? Uh, verse 23. Be not, or verse 33, back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Be not deceived. Look at this. Evil communication. That word communication translates to company. Evil company corrupts good manners or good habits so if you have people that are no good it's not long before their habits become your habits evil company corrupts good manners or corrupts good habit habits you know they're not trying to conform to you evil company wants you to conform to them people that are in the world want you to come out of the kingdom and join them in the world People that are in the world is not looking to come into the kingdom unless they're looking to forsake the world. But the, if, you're, if they're in the world, they're looking to have you come out of the kingdom and become part of the world once again. Amen. Evil company corrupts good manners. And that's what's going on in this place of worship. Uh, when you, What you're reading about in Corinth, you got people that come that's in the world that has come into the church. They've infiltrated the church. And now they're trying to bring confusion. You know, the scriptures is calling them evil. And you're getting into the habit of walking with God and loving him and consulting him and standing on faith. And the evilness of these people are trying to corrupt your habits to diffuse this relationship that you have uh, between you and the Lord God. Uh, with Jesus being the mediator in between. Verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some uh, have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Amen. So in my opinion. Powerful Bible study. You know. Um, now he goes on here. And the rest of the, the second half of this. Is just as powerful as the first half. This gets real evil. As I was reading this, it was eye-opening to me myself. So uh, let me continue to read here. Verse 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up uh, with that? And with what body do they come? So as some of the people make their argument, like the Apostle Paul made his argument by saying that I'm a witness. The one that the brother that didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a witness, meaning that he's a believer now. And then 500 other people that seen him, they are witnesses and believers too. So Paul uses that to make his case that Jesus has risen from the dead. So the unbelievers, the case that they have made uh, to, 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 to uh, solidify their, the, the, the case that they're making, um, they're saying, what about the body then? Um, if... God is raising, if Jesus was raised from the dead and the, ra and the dead do rise from death, then how do you explain the state of the body? So that's the argument that they're making to uphold their case. Okay? But look at the argument that, <laughs> that the Apostle Paul rebuts them with. Powerful argument. One of the most powerful arguments that it was eye-opening to me to study this. So. Uh, but let's let's read on here because this is this is pretty interesting. Verse thirty six, thou fool, thou thou which soweth is not brought to life except it die. So that word quicken is brought to life. Um, so he says, thou fool, don't you you don't know that which uh, soweth is not brought to life 
unless it dies. And here's what he means. And he's going to actually break it down. But I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a little bit of his breakdown. And what he's saying is if you are a sower as a farmer, if you take some seed and you sow it into the ground, the state of that seed has to die. It's not going to remain in that state. As a matter of fact, when it's time for that seed to come to life, because you're taking the seed and you're killing its former, its present state, you're setting it in the ground so its present state can die. And when life is brought forth from that seed, it no longer looks like the seed that was placed in the ground. Life comes out of that seed in whatever you planted in the ground. Um, if you take watermelon seed and you plant it in the ground, that's, that present state of the seed that was placed in the ground has to die uh, in its state so that the life of the new form of it comes forth. And Paul equates that to the death of man and the resurrection of man. The present state of man goes into the ground as seed. It's like seed. It goes into the ground. But when the harvest or when the life of that seed comes forth, it comes forth a new body. Amen. A new state. A new body. Because the old had to die. The old seed of death had to die in the ground in order for the new life to come forth. That's what that's and that's the example that that the wisdom of God gives us through the Apostle Paul. And it's a powerful example. It's eye opening to me. So he said, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened or is not alive, except it dies. It says, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but merely grain, bare grain. You're, you're just sowing grain. And it, which is less than the body. So he said, and what you're sowing in the ground, you're sowing just grain, merely just grain. You're not sowing a body. You yourselves as farmers, you sow grain. And look at the example that grain or, or some other form of grain. But God giveth a, a body as it pleaseth him and to every seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. He says, so the example that I give you, you're sowing lesser things. And if you're able to take lesser things and sow it and you're able to get this harvest, what about God taking a body itself and sowing it into a ground? That's the example that, that, that Paul is eye-opening here. If man can take a seed and sow it into the ground in his present state and get this fruit from something that had to, to come out of his former state and bring forth this harvest, what about God taking the body and sowing it into the earth and then bringing forth this new harvest, a new state of the present that was once dead. That's powerful. He goes on to say in verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial, which is heavenly. There's a heavenly body. There's an earth, that word terrestrial. There are earthly bodies. But the glory of the, celest of the celestial is one. The glory of the terrestrial is another. He says, there is one glory of the sun, and there's a glory of the moon. There's another glory of the stars, and then there's, there's one star different from another star in glory. So he said, it, as men are able to take the seed and sow it into the ground and they're able to bring forth a, a, a new state, so God is able to do that, is take various flesh and sow it and bring forth another. He says there are various different things that they, that they started off at one thing and then they end up going into another state. And he says just like the earth, he says you have the heavenly bodies, he says you have Fish, the bodies of fish, the bodies of bird, the bodies of humans, the bodies of stars, the bodies of the sun. There are various bodies, but all of them are subject to doing the same thing. That God will bring forth uh, one and allow it to die so that something new can come out of it. God is able to do that out of all various bodies. That's, that's how he's able to do it. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Okay? So it's it is sown in one state. 
but it comes forth into another state. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It is sown at a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam is calling the Lord Jesus Christ the last Adam. The last Adam was made a, li a life-giving spirit. That word quickening here is a life-giving spirit. The first one, uh, life had to be breathed into him. The second one, the second Adam, life actually came out of him, right? Because he himself was life. So the first one, life, the first man, life had to be given to him. But the last man that God made, which the Lord Adam, this, this, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was considered the last Adam, life was already inside of him. It needed to come out. Life giving needed to come out to, to, so that everybody can have a part of it. Amen. Powerful, powerful, powerful. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which was natural. And afterwards, which is spiritual. So you can already see the results. The first one, there was, there was made from the dust. That wasn't spiritual, but that was an earthly. And now the next man, which is man 2.0, if you will, he is spiritual. That's our final state. We got a chance to, we're living in our first state, which was the state of Adam. But we shall rise in our second state, which is the state of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is spiritual. Amen. He goes on to say here in verse 48, and he says, as it's the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So I just got done saying, our first state is that that we're living at right now is the is the earthy state. This is why when we die, our body our, our, our breaks down and return back to the earth. But when we come forth uh, uh, as in our second state, which is the state of the Lord Jesus Christ, a heavenly state, a spiritual state, if you will, we come forth incorruptible. There is no more death in us, if you will. There is eternal life in us. Amen. So that just like a seed going into the ground in one state, but it comes forth another. When we come out of the ground, we come forth in a different state. So that's, that's a powerful thing. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither do a corruption inher inherit incorruption. So we can't come forth in the kingdom. With, we can't come into an eternal kingdom living in immortal bodies. We have to experience immortality to be able to inherit an immortal kingdom. Amen. An eternal kingdom. We have to be immortal to inherit an, an eternal kingdom. In our present state, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, uh, inherit the kingdom of God in our present state. Amen. Uh, the eternal kingdom to come. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. We're going to be transformed. And that's just as was the Lord Jesus was transformed when he was on the mountaintop. And instantaneously he was transformed. Very powerful. We, we, we read about that. Uh, you can go back and read that. It, it was something very powerful. But for the sake of time, we'll continue here. Uh, so he said at when the time comes, instantaneously, no different than turning on the life switch, we're going, if we're alive when the time come, if we're not already in the ground, but we're alive when the time come, we're going to instantly be changed. Amen. And even those that are in the ground, when the Lord Jesus come, they're going to instantly be changed. Amen. It says in the moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And we already read 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. That covers what Paul is saying here. For this incorrupt, for this corruptible, rather, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, 
and this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And you can read about that in um, Hosea chapter 13, uh, verse 14. Uh, Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. Uh, o death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. And remember, we know how the, the we've talked about this. If you ever uh, followed Romans, our, our teachings in Romans, we talk about about sin, uh, how sin used the law. And I'll give you an example where it says uh, the strength of sin is the law. I'll give you an example. Um, so you lay the law down to your kids. Um, don't don't take the car. Maybe you have a son that drives and you say, don't take the car uh, past 8 o'clock. You, you need to be in the house. You can't, have the, you can't take the car past 8. And then when your parents are asleep, it's maybe 9 or 10, you get up and you sneak and take the car. Well, I'm, it's possible that you can make a case to say that there was an influence. You told me not to take the car. And I thought to myself, man, now I'm thinking I might need to take the car, you know. And so now you're thinking I'm going to take the car. When they go to sleep, I'm going to have to take the car. That was a pathway to sin. There, would, there wouldn't have been no breaking of the law if I didn't tell you what rules could be broken. And once I told you what rules could be broken, then you set out to break the rules. The law, there would be no sin if I didn't tell you what I considered to be a sin. If I didn't speak and tell you what was a sin, if God didn't speak and tell us what was sin, then there would be no sin to have said that, that you broke this and now it's sin. Do you understand that? So when God told the woman in the garden, when God told both Adam and Eve in the garden, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he spoke against that if he never spoke against it then they would have never sinned but because he spoke against it once they committed the act then there was sin that's why that's why the law is considered the strength of sin because it it allows sin to exist because you broke the rule you you if if you break the law then you're a lawbreaker. You can't be a lawbreaker if you didn't break a law. If there was no law, then you wouldn't be a lawbreaker is what I'm saying. But you broke the law, so now you're a lawbreaker. Well, it's the same as sin. There would be, you would not be a sinner if there was no sin to commit. But because God had already established the rules and said that if you break this, you are a sinner. If you commit this, you are a sinner. Sin uses that. That's the strength of sin which is the law of God, the precepts of the Most High God. Once God put the precepts out there and said that if you break it, then you will be found in violation of this. Well, sin, when God says, don't cover thy neighbor's wife, all of a sudden, you're like, I wonder why can't I cover thy neighbor's wife? So you go looking out your window. There's a window behind me. That's why I turned around as for an example, right? And our neighbor's house is behind so we got neighbors all around. But if you, if you, if the Lord said, "Don't cover, don't covet thy neighbor's wife," and then you go and you look and be like, "Hmm," He says for me not to covet thy neighbor's wife. Let me go just take a look and see why He told me not to covet thy neighbor's wife. And then all of a sudden you go looking and and you go fantasizing and you go thinking. Well, you wouldn't have never had that if the if if the law wasn't there to say don't do it. It, it like it sparks curiosity is what I'm trying to say, and that's the example of when it says that uh, that the law is the strength, or, or it says that um, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, and there there that's why it's like that because it's. Without the law, uh, then there could be no sin. But once God speaks against it, then all of a sudden it sparks curiosity within your flesh. Why did he tell me not to? I need to give it a shot. Just like the woman in the garden. Just like Eve in the garden. 
when God told them not to not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the enemy comes and be like, hey, did God say not to eat of that tree? He brought up the law and made the woman think about the law. And because it provoked the woman to think about it and reason with it, then she made a decision to break it. There wouldn't have been no sin if God had not spoke against eating of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So hopefully you got that. Hopefully I didn't over explain it like I have the tendency to do. But trust me when I say I mean well and I'll be hoping that you get it. Amen. Uh, closing out our Bible study, verse 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved uh, brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. So that's going to take care of our Bible study. And again, remember, this is a letter that he has sent to the church of Corinth because of what was happening there. So he's addressing some of these matters that have come up. And he ends it by saying how important it is that our faith is renewed daily uh, in, in the coming of our Lord Jesus and what will happen, the steps that will happen. He, t he tells us that because the reason why Jesus had to be resurrected from the dead so that we can have eternal life and he is going to come from, he is going to come for us. So we have to stand, be unmovable in our faith and always working toward that concerning the Lord. Uh, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain because it's going to pay off in the end. Powerful, powerful Bible study, at least not for you, maybe for me, not that I had questions of resurrection, never questioned that, but it's good to have a refresher course of why we believe and why it's important for us to uh, to, to stand guard, to, to guard our faith and always moving toward that mark. Amen? Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 11 uh, verses uh, 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. So God wants to raise us from the dead like he did that of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to have eternal life. He wants us to be a part of his family and to remain his children. And so the Lord Jesus Christ uh, because all things is in the Lord Jesus' hands. He has authority over all things. Um, Jesus is offering uh, for, he has, the, he has the right and the authority to offer unto all that will to become a part of the family. And so Jesus invites us into, to, to have eternal life, to share eternal life with him and his father. So here's the invitation. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. He says unto us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You're, 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 you are pressed down with work and you're tired. He says, And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He says, For I am meek and I'm lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. So this is an invitation to become part of the family, to accept the gift of salvation that's being offered uh, by God from his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the invitation to have eternal life, to make Jesus not only your savior, which is to save you from your sins, but to also make him your captain, your Lord, that you obey him. Amen. So now, how do I so how do I become a part of the family? If Jesus is offering, how do I accept his invitation? Come with me to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. And this is how you accept the invitation. That if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. We just got done talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you have to confess him as Lord over your life, meaning you're calling on him and you're saying, I've repented of my sins and I believe that you are the only begotten son of God and I want to make you Lord over my life. 
because God has rose has brought you up from the dead and I shall inherit eternal life because of that. I believe on you and I'll make you Lord over my life. He says that if if you shall confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus making him your Lord and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. And this is why the Apostle Paul was saying that you don't want your belief to be in vain. You don't want nobody to rob you of your belief that God has rose them from the dead, that God has raised Jesus from the dead, because that's the criteria of you being saved. And if you take away your faith that Jesus was risen from the dead, then you have no salvation. Hmm? He goes on to say in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, Confession is made unto salvation. This is why we believe. This is why God said that if you believe and you confess, because you're going to you're going to speak what's in your heart to speak. And God knows the hearts that He knows the substance of our heart. And so He that's the criteria that He used <coughs> for you to obtain salvation. To believe that Jesus really rose from the dead. That he is the only begotten son of God. And for you to confess that he is Lord. He is the only begotten son of God. Amen. He did rise from the dead. For the scripture saith, whoso believeth on him should not be ashamed. He's not going to disappoint you. He is not going to let you down. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. So the, the invitation to eternal life, the gift of eternal life that God offered to the Jews, he's also offering to the Gentiles. So it says there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God is willing to do his part. You have to be willing to do your part. Your part is, is repenting, confessing, and calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. His job is to save you from your sins and to transform you. Amen. Go with me to 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Again, it's going to talk about our part going to talk about God's part. 1 John chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's saying what we can expect if from, from God, what we can expect from God and what he expects from us. What we can expect from God if we do those things that he expects from us. And what does he expect for, 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 what is God expecting from us? He expects us to confess and we're not just telling him of what we've done wrong, but we're, we have stopped doing it and let him know what it was that we put to rest. We could tell him, I've stopped doing this. Here's the things that I have been doing. Okay. So if we can so if we do our part, our part is to confess our sins, his part is to forgive us and to cleanse us from the sins that we've committed. Because we, we are stained, we're tattooed, you know, from the from from what we've got. You ever have some white shoes and you get something on them, or if you don't clean them, then they'll remain, you know, blotched. They'll remain, you know, smudged uh, from whatever it was that was on them. Well, once you let God know what you've done wrong, just like you clean your shoes to get them all pretty and white again, God cleans us and put us on a garment, you know, to make sure that we remain holy and chaste and right, righteous, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He cleanses us so that there is no reminders. When we finally come before him, he makes sure that there is no reminder of our past that he is going to judge us on. So if we, if we have a tattooed stain on us uh, from adultery, from fornication, from theft, 
whatever it was that you've done wrong, if you tell God that I've, I've repented over what I've done, this is what I've done, and I'm sorry to have done it, and I'm no longer doing that, that's it, I'm done with that, then whatever has been, been stained on us from the sin, he cleansed that off because he don't want any reminder. Once he makes his mind up to forgive you, he don't want any reminders upon you letting him know what you've once done. So he cleanses you to make sure that there is no reminder. That means you don't even bring it up again either. If you stop doing it, you don't bring it up. Once you bring it over to Christ, once you bring it to God through, through Jesus Christ, you no longer live in the guilt of that if you sincerely let that thing go. Amen? Now there's a danger if we don't follow through and do our part. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, meaning that we won't, we act like, you know, everything is everything, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So if we don't do our part, he cannot do his part concerning us. He cannot cleanse us. He cannot wash us if we don't bring to him matters that, that we need to be cleansed and delivered and forgiven of. Amen? So we have to do our part if we expect God to do his part. Lastly, go with me to, to uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 42. This is referencing the day of Pentecost, uh, the day that the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and not just fell upon them but came into the disciples and began to use their tongues to minister to various nationalities that were present on this day of Pentecost uh, and ministered to them in their language through the, through the tongues of the disciples. Once those that were present heard their native language being spoken of by the disciples then the Holy Ghost had their attention and Peter began to bear witness to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, but the day of Pentecost is this day where the Holy Spirit falls down, fell down upon the disciples and not only fell down, fell down upon them but came inside of them. This is where you hear the term baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So here's, here's this, what Peter says. Uh, after the Holy Spirit got the attention of those that were present. This is Acts chapter 2 beginning at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he says the, the person that, that was put on that cross with nails in his hands and nails in his feet, a crown of thorns upon his head, the person that was that allowed us to put him on the cross. He is the only begotten son of God. He is the Messiah, that word Christ, the anointed one of God, the Messiah. He is the Lord, the Messiah. Uh, Peter began to break that down to everyone that was present. And look at what happened. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted. They didn't want to just let this truth fall by the wayside. They wanted to do something about it. They wanted to live according to what they have just received, the, the truth that they have just received from the man of God, or in this case, from the Holy Spirit. So here's what Peter tells them in order to follow through. He says, because they said, what can we do about this matter? Peter tells him in verse 38, repent. What is repentance? Turning away from the sin. It means to stop sinning, to repent, to, to change your ways, not just your mind, but your ways about it. Uh, not just your ways, but your mind. Because somebody can tell you to stop doing it and you stop doing it, but you don't see why you have to stop. But repentance is when you are under a different mindset and you have a change of heart about it because you know it's wrong and you yourself have come into the understanding of why it's wrong and you stop doing it, right? So repentance is to stop doing it. Number two, Peter tells them, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. So 
those of you that hear this broadcast, you, you're listening to this recording, and you say, okay, I've called upon the Lord Jesus so that I can be saved. I've made him both Lord and Savior over my life. I confessed and I've repented. I want to get baptized. We get caught up on these places of worship. And I agree with you to a certain extent. These places of worship should not be telling you that you have to join this place of worship to be baptized. Now, in saying that, neither should you be saying I'm not going to get baptized until I find a place that's not going to charge me with that. You know what I mean? You, you're making a commitment to God, not to man. That man is a barrier or an obstacle that has been placed in your way f for you to uh, facilitate that commitment to God. And you're letting that person rob you of your commitment. And because you're holding out, you're not you're not getting it done and you're you're not you're not doing what you obligated yourself to do amen and true enough that place should not be in the business of telling people that you need to be a member here for us to do that that's just that's not right amen now if god if if god working through jesus and through his holy spirit has found an immediate way for you to get baptized um, then fine. But if there is no immediate way, then it's more important for you to keep your promise with God and get it done than for you to allow uh, you to rob God of the agreement that you made to get it done. Don't, don't do that. That's a bigger crime than I think what, their, what, what a place of worship would be facilitating. So, now, concerning baptism, you're going to tell the man of God that you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've repented of your sins, and you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That man of God is going to take you and, and totally submerge you. Not No, we don't sprinkle on, take them and sprinkle on people, because Christ wasn't partially dead. He was fully laid to rest. And when I look at Sprinkle, that's like saying he was partially dead. You know, he was still on life support or something. That's not that's not how that goes. Amen. So we are totally submerged into the water and we are immediately brought up out of the water. The man of God is going to totally submerge you. You are baptized in the Lord Jesus. You are buried in Christ Jesus, and you are resurrected in Christ Jesus. Just as Christ was placed into the ground and he was resurrected out of the ground uh, from the from the dead. He was placed. He was placed in the tomb, uh, meaning that he died, went into the depths of the earth, if you will, uh, spiritually, and then he came up, to, came back to life. That's what baptism is for us. Our old man goes down totally into the water. Our new man comes up out of the water. Your old man is down and all of your old ways and all those old things that you've done is now gone and your new man comes up out of the water. A new creature in Christ. All things are made new. So Peter is telling them that they need to get that done. And then he says, uh, you can expect to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He finishes up 30, 38 by saying you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you want to make sure you get that done. Then he says, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. We know that to be true because we just read uh, that Jesus in Matthew, 20, in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus offered anyone that were willing to come unto him, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Right? So that's a promise. That's, he's saying, I have a place for you. I have a rest for you. I've made room for you. Well, that's backed up by here. The promise is unto you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation or from this perverse generation. Again, it's, it all starts with you. God done his part. Now you have to do your part to allow this other part for God to, to do on your behalf. You have the responsibility to separate yourself from a perverse generation. 
And God has a responsibility to keep you once you separate yourself, to bring you into his family and to keep you as long as you allow yourself to be kept by God. Amen. Verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they can, and this is important because once we start walking, one of our brothers just got baptized and, and he wanted to know, um, oh, you know, and as far as our Bible study goes, uh, what should what should he put his what should he start with? And that was a blessing to hear him say that, because we don't want to get saved and then be idle. Whatever it took for us to get to where we need to to where we needed to be spiritually, it takes just that much and more to stay there so that we can be able to grow. We don't just want to reach the plateau of having to be saved, but we want to grow within our salvation. We want to grow within our gifts and callers, within our walk with God. This will help you do that. Uh, verse 42, they continue steadfast in the, in the apostles' doctrine, that word. They stayed in the word of God, and they fellowshiped. It says, and in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Amen? So that's what they did. That's what kept them uh, heading on the right track and on the right path. So that's going to conclude our Bible study. And lastly, just let me pray for those that have accepted uh, the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior over their lives. Eternal God, we glorify you. You are worthy, so worthy to be praised. You are so worthy to be lifted up, to be magnified. For us to call you Abba, for us to call you Papa, for us to call you God and creator of our lives. Because, Lord, you are worthy. Your goodness, your mercy, it is bestowed upon us moment to moment, day by day. And we acknowledge it. We acknowledge your goodness. The fact that we're able to open our eyes, to walk, to talk, to move about, to have our well-being. It's because of your goodness, your mercy, your love, and your compassion towards us. Now, Father, there are those that have experienced your goodness within this lesson. The Holy Ghost had pricked their hearts. They've heard and felt you nudging at them for them to become a part of your family. It is the way you call us because you draw us out of your love and your kindness. Father, there have been many that have heard this recording, and not just this recording, but there are many around the world that have heard and felt the nudge and heard you call them, and they have answered your call, and they have come to your throne, and they have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. They have repented of their sins, and they have called you Abba. Father, we pray for them right now in the name of Jesus that you would nurture them, that you would inspire them, that you would grow them, that they would be vessels that would bring you such great glory. Lord, thank you for the addition to the kingdom. Thank you for saving them. Thank you for atoning for our sins, Lord. Thank you for redeeming us redeeming us, God. Now, Father, we pray for their continued success, that they would grow, that they would fellowship, that they would stay within the word of God, that they would come to know you, that they would never return to this world. But, Father, that they would be used to draw others out of the world, that they may come into the kingdom, because Jesus made room for us. God, thank you so much for so many things that you have done and continue to do. Lord Jesus, thank you for laying down your life, going through those things that you have gone through for us, and even interceding for us as you are there on the right-hand side of your Father. Now, Lord God, there are many more that still needs to come unto you, and we pray 
that you would keep nudging at their heart, convicting them that they may finally hear you call and that they may finally answer. This is our prayer. Our prayer right now is not only for those that are saved, but for others who have not been saved. Father, we bless you. We love you. And we thank you for all things in the name of Jesus, who is Christ. We pray. Amen. Folks, I had a wonderful time. And, and I don't know if anybody had a, if I don't know if anybody had a chance to eat because I stayed at the table eating. I, I hope I didn't eat at all <laughs> because it was a good meal for me. Um. And I bless God that he that he, he leaves enough for us, amen. But hopefully uh, it was a good Bible study for you. And, uh, again, it was a refresher course for me, and it was good. I, I, this benediction and this blessing, I would like to uh, speak upon your life uh, as we end this broadcast. Um, and hopefully you walk in the blessings of the Lord as you take and receive them. Amen. We already read the scripture where it says there is no difference between the Jews and the Greeks. The same Lord, uh, the same Lord is 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 rich uh, towards all. You know, when it comes to giving us not only salvation but all things that He have, He's the same Lord is rich. He's rich in all things, and so this as He have blessed the children of Israel, I believe this blessing is is to is he's rich enough to bless us to if we believe uh, and, and we continue in his precepts. Amen. This is coming from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee, and the Lord keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee, and to be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and to give thee peace. I pronounce that upon your families and you. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study. Uh, remember those that need prayer. Uh, remember this, this part of the kingdom of God, this, this ministry. As you are giving to God's kingdom, uh, if he has you to be mindful of this memory, uh, this memory, if this ministry, if you will, if he has you mindful, we can always use your help. Uh, but more than anything, be obedient to God. Be courageous and stay in, in the uh, being of love. Because that's one thing that I feel that's missing in this world is, is we have to be beacons of God's love. Amen. And that means more to me than anything. Amen. So God bless you. We love you. And we'll, Lord willing, we'll see you for our next broadcast. God bless you. This has been a United Body of Christ Church video production. You can visit our website at www.ubcchurch.org.